Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. Well, you know, there are many that claim simply because of my proximity to the University of Southern California that I am a Trojan homer. Well, these claims, egregious as they are, also took place when I worked at another sports company 3,500 miles away. Um, I will admit that I was a Pac-12 fan growing up, and I've always rooted for the top dog in the Pac-12 to represent my region of the country where I was born and now live. And USC, uh, Oregon, and Washington have been the teams in my lifetime. When they're really, really good, they can at least buy for a national championship. Um, and so I'm just going to lean into it and give you a little 15-minute season preview. I know this is primarily for you LA peeps. But for you Big Ten fans now, as the Trojans join the conference, I think I have pretty good access to that program. I've been talking with people today on the phone. So I think schedules are really important for good teams, not nearly as important for great teams. I think Ohio State, Oregon, uh, Georgia, Alabama are just going to win a lot of games, period, regardless of where they're played. USC will not be a great team. They're too young offensively. They're too thin Uh, offensively and on the D-line to be a great team. But let's start with their schedule. They got several huge breaks. Ohio State and Oregon, best two teams in the Big Ten, in my opinion, not on the schedule. Uh, Penn State, Notre Dame, to me, arguably two of the top three teams on their schedule are at home, and LSU, neutral field, but in Vegas, closer to the West. That's a break. That is a scheduling break. In fact, the only part of USC schedule that's a bad break is the Nebraska game, which is scheduled in between two rivals, Washington and UCLA. I think USC is better than all three of those teams, but sandwich games are killers. Uh, USC, if you go to the last decade, has often played very poorly before the UCLA game or the Notre Dame game. So Washington and Seattle, UCLA in Southern California, right smack dab in the middle is a very clever head coach, Matt Rule, and a Nebraska team I think is underrated, undervalued. Uh, that's got that's got upset loss uh, written all over it. Outside of that, though, a lot of the um, go either way games, uh, Penn State, Notre Dame, uh, you know LSU, they don't have to go on the road. So that's a scheduling break and no Buckeyes or Ducks, and they are not as good as those teams. I think USC is too young and thin on offense to be great and not talented enough uh, on the defensive line to be great. Let's talk about the offense. So they've got four sophomores who will get a majority of the reps at wide receiver. Uh, All of them talented. Uh, Branch, uh, Deuce Robinson, um, Lemon, uh, Lane, unique body types, some more possession than others. Deuce Robinson's a great baseball prospect, uh, tight end, hybrid wide receiver. They put him out wide. They're tough matchups. A lot of different body types, all sophomores, all really, really good four- and five-star prospects. Not a lot of depth behind them, but um, I, I think they'll get a majority of the snaps. All are capable of beating coverage. I think Miller Moss is very coachable. There'll be less ad-libbing. It will look more like a Lincoln-Riley offense. Now, what do we know about him? Uh, He was dominant against a pretty uninspired Louisville team in a bowl game where those young receivers flourished. Um, The offensive line, again, really talented. A lot of four-star recruits. Uh, Elijah Page, left tackle. Uh, They flipped him from Notre Dame at the very last second. He's a redshirt freshman. Uh, I think he's their second most talented offensive lineman. 
to uh, Monheim, who will be one of the top five centers in the country. He's moved around the offensive line. I think he anchors it at center. I couldn't tell you the last time USC had a really high-end NFL caliber first or second round center. Been a while. Um, and Monheim will anchor it. Page at left tackle is exceptional, but young. Everywhere across that line, it's sophomores, redshirt freshmen, um, some actual decent depth on the interior, but most of it unproven. But again, these were highly acclaimed um, prospects that USC beat out bigger schools or big schools, big brands. And so, and, and I've been told the coaches like what they see up front, but this offense is not deep. It at running back, talented, not deep. At tight end, not that talented and not that deep. So it's not going to be a dynamic offense like we've seen the last couple of years, but I think it can be uh, um, at times a ball control offense. I think there were times last year with Caleb Williams that the staff didn't want to get him hurt once the national championship was out of reach. Um, there were some calls they wouldn't make. Uh, you know, Caleb was running for his life, breakdowns on the offensive line. I can tell you the staff really likes the talent level of this offensive line. They were greatly disappointed in last year's unit. But again, it's a really, really, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, body type, speed, dynamic running backs, it's just thin. Um, and I've said this before, uh, Jim Harbaugh could double Brady Hoke's wins the first year at Michigan. Brian Kelly could do the same at Notre Dame. But those teams really didn't look like a Georgia or a Bama or an Ohio State until about year six for Harbaugh, year six for Brian Kelly. USC fooled a lot of people with Caleb Williams. They were a play from 12 wins the first year. They were not a they were not an 11 win team. Oh, that may have been their record. But it was a lot of Caleb Williams, Jordan Addison, and, you know, people in the Pac-12 didn't know what to make of Lincoln Riley. They had never faced him before. He had a competitive advantage. Um, last year, came back down to earth. Miller Moss, more than capable, four-star kid, good body size, decent arm, uh, willing to throw the ball down the field. I think he'll be really strong. But it will be a different offense. Maybe less, less ad-libbing, a little less risk-taking more of it in the pocket, but I think they're going to score high 20s, low 30s on most Saturdays. If you're ever injured, check out Morgan & Morgan. It's America's largest injury law firm, and they are there for you. Over 100 offices nationwide. Think about that. More than 1,000 lawyers with over 20 billion, that's a B, $20 billion recovered for over 500,000 clients. Things happen in life unexpectedly. Submitting an injury claim with Morgan & Morgan is really, really easy. Like winning in the NFL is hard. We know that quarterbacking in the NFL is hard. Submitting a claim is easy. You're ever injured? Check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash Colin or dial pound law from your cell phone. Morgan & Morgan has a proven track record of fighting for you to get a full and fair compensation if there's an unexpected accident in your life. And I've had a few. Defensively, the secondary, due to transfers and good recruiting, um, is about as deep and about as talented as I remember it. Even during Pete Carroll's great years, Corner was kind of a soft spot. You know, Pete did so well at linebacker, defensive line, uh, skill players offensively, built great staffs, uh, Norm Chow, Sark, Lane Kiffin. But Pete's teams weren't great at corner. This team's actually got size and depth and speed and experience at both safety and corner. I think it's the strongest part of the team. I really do, the back end. Uh, I also think they have some depth, finally, for the first time in years at linebacker. Um, and a couple of their, if you go to this past year's recruiting class, they will be special teamers, but they've got some young, true freshmen at linebacker. Won't get a ton of snaps in games. They also have some commitments going ahead. It was a, it was a unit that has been down at USC for years. I think it will be a stronger linebacking core. They do not have the size. Bear Alexander has an NFL body. He's hit and miss when it comes to effort. Um, I, I don't, I think they'll have a, a decent edge rush, more talent there. 
I don't think they have uh, the depth or the size or the talent on the interior. I think they'll get pushed around a little bit by LSU in the opener, by Penn State, uh, and by Notre Dame at various times in the season. But I think the biggest upgrade this, to this entire staff is the defensive coaches. Whenever you leave a program, Nick Saban leaves Michigan State to LSU. Hey, guys, who's getting on the plane? Who's getting on that booster's jet or that school jet and flying to the new job? Whoever gets on that jet on your staff, you're not going to move their family for one year. There may be guys getting on that jet that you wouldn't have chosen, but Alex Grinch got on that jet as a defensive coordinator for USC. And Lincoln Riley was disappointed after year one, um, suffered greatly in year two. They have significantly paid for and upgraded the defensive staff. I talked to two people that have been at practice this week, and they said they think the defense, especially early in the season, will lead the team. It will not be the offense. The offense is young. The feeling with USC is the offense will get better as the season progresses, but it will be the defense initially that carries the team. And that's hopeful because Michigan is very early in the season in the first month. They are really rebuilding that offense. LSU lost two world-class college receivers and an excellent number two pick in the draft, Jaden Daniels at quarterback. And this LSU program, like USC, can't get their defense right. So facing LSU first game, bit of a break. They could be really good. I don't think they'll be great early. Um, and I don't think USC offensively will be a great team early. That'll grow. But I think what I'm hearing um, and what I'm seeing at a camp from people I really trust is the defense has really come together. It's been simplified. There's been an elevation of coaching. And I and I and when I looked over the schedule today, I said LSU is a coin flip. Uh, they're favored LSU by six. So let's say it's a loss. I think they beat Utah State, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and at Minnesota. I think they lose to Penn State. I think they beat Maryland Rutgers and a close one over Washington. Washington in a complete offensive rebuild, though I do think Jed Fish is a really talented offensive coach. Nebraska, I'll put that as a loss. It's a sandwich game. They beat UCLA, lose to Notre Dame. So I have four losses, um, eight wins. And that's kind of... That's kind of where the DraftKings and Vegas has them. Um, I think the offense by the end of the year will be very hopeful. I think the defense initially will stand out as a major upgrade. Um, but I, I've tried to pump the brakes for all the people that are critical of Lincoln Riley. First of all, there's a lot of good news at USC. The collective may not be Texas or Oregon, but it's around 13, 13 and a half million. And if they... If they beat LSU, if it feels very good up to that Penn State game, which is a toughie, Penn State is, to me, the third most talented team in the conference behind Oregon and Ohio State. Um, it's at home. It's at the Coliseum, but it's a tough one. Um, you know, that collective may improve. Fans, boosters, donors can be fickle based on momentum of the program, momentum of the program. So, you know, I think there's the collective's good. I think Jen Cohn and Lincoln Riley have some symmetry now. May have been bumpy early. They have some symmetry. I think the defensive staff has been upgraded. I think uh, the freshman class that just came, arrived here in fall camp, has some real size in the defensive front. It's going to be a lot of special teams guys and redshirting, but there's some promising size on the interior of the defensive line. And I think, uh, I think Miller Moss is going to surprise people. Uh, Miller's a guy that uh, I had been in a conversation with him and a friend about a year ago, and, you know, it was tough for him. Not that he was considering transferring, but it had, it had gone through his mind that he knew he wasn't going to play much at all last year, and it was tough for him. He was a, a very ballyhooed local recruit, but um, I think he was smart to stick it out. I think he's talented, and I think you saw it against Louisville. And again, he's he's a risk taker. He's he's not he's not going to play it safe. He'll He'll let it rip. But I think the offense will look different. It will look more conventional. Uh, it will look a bit maybe more predictable, uh, less out of the pocket, and that's okay. I felt, you know, I said this with Matt LaFleur and the Green Bay Packers with Aaron Rodgers. It felt like a 50-50 split. Half Matt's offense, half Aaron. 
Last year with Jordan Love, I felt like it was Matt LaFleur's offense. At the end of last year, mid to the end of the year, I thought it was Caleb's offense. Right, right. I thought the first year was a combination of Caleb and Lincoln. I I, th I thought there were times last year, it, it kind of felt like Caleb was doing what Caleb wanted to do. And as we've seen in the preseason, that's okay. That's not Miller Moss. Um, but I think it'll take a step back in terms of being dynamic, but it'll work. And I, and I, I still contend that Lincoln Riley is one of the smartest offensive coaches in football. Uh, is he a great culture builder, staff builder? That's yet to be seen. But the expectations off that first 11 win season, which could have easily been 12 if they hold the lead in the last 45 seconds against Tulane, raise the bar beyond reasonable expectations. Third year at Michigan, Jim Harbaugh won in only eight games, and they were losing to Michigan State and getting clubbed by Ohio State. This stuff takes time. The idea that the transfer portal is this magic elixir, go ask Deion Sanders, Brian Kelly, or Lincoln Riley. You can improve. First of all, people that leave programs, there's usually a reason, mostly except quarterbacks. Um, you know, quarterbacks generally, they're, they're going to go find the best coach available, the best receivers available. A lot of receive, a lot of quarterback moves in college football, I get. They're upgrading to better coaches and, and better programs. But a lot of transfers in the transfer portal, um, nobody's losing any sleep when they leave. I mean, if you're a USC fan, look at all the players that have transferred out of USC. How many stars did you lose? Super valuable players. You know, players transfer when they're not playing or when they're unhappy with their situation. So I think there's limitations on cultural development, uh, chemistry. Um, you know, Jordan Addison and, and Caleb were obviously home runs. Who's the third best transfer they've had? Seriously. So uh, I think I think Brian, Dion, and Lincoln are all sensing that. High school recruiting has to be the backbone of your program. So there you go. Say it again. Lose close to LSU, close to Penn State, Notre Dame in that sandwich game against Nebraska. But I see eight wins. Don't get into the playoff, but you'll feel good when the season ends. The offense is young, getting better. You got your quarterback, and the defense finally has a legitimate coaching staff.